Next, we have uh, Fernando Rios, who's currently a clear postdoctoral fellow in the Data Management Services Group at Johns Hopkins, Hopkins University. Uh, he has been active in software development, academia, and, in, and industry, uh, working areas of geographic information systems, groundwater modeling, incident <coughs> management, and he has been working quite a bit on software curation readiness that he spoke about at the panel yesterday. So I believe this talk, integrating software curation into existing data management workflows is what he's going to talk about today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great, so uh, yeah, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, what we've been thinking of at Hopkins in terms of integrating software uh, curation and preservation into our existing uh, data management workflows. So, I don't think we, I need to convince anybody in this audience that you know, the publication, the data, and the code are all critical parts of scholarship, right? Um, but when you start thinking of services uh, in a library environment, um, there's a, a little bit of a gap in terms of providing software-related services. So we've done a lot of with data, right? So at Hopkins, what we do in the data management services group is uh, we provide services around things like writing data management plans, um, data archiving in the JT data archive, and uh, basically guidance around all aspects of data management. Like, um, so one of the things we do is uh, do training sessions on de-identification, for example. So, uh, you know, software can fit into all of these categories, um, but for this presentation, I'm just going to focus on, on one of them. Um, and that's the, the software archiving part. So uh, in, in, in thinking of expanding the software archiving to include uh, software in a, in a more comprehensive way, um, we, we basically started from scratch thinking of, you know, what are we equipped to offer to begin with? Uh, where does the service fit or where does whatever we want to do fit into our workflows and how does it fit? So in figuring out this first point, what are we equipped to do? Uh, it helped us to conceptualize uh, how software relates to preservation. So I'm not gonna explain all this in detail, but what this shows is basically uh, software that's kind of been broken up into pieces that are uh, in essence preservable, right? Uh, so you have your source code, um, dependencies, your executable and its dependencies. And associated with them, there are a bunch of different kinds of preservation activities, just very generic categories. So you have things like uh, updating the source code to run on new environments, um, capturing your, your software <laughs> and environment using things like emulation or virtualization, or just keeping the, the physical pieces um, somewhere. So if you, if you kind of chain different uh, activities together, you can achieve different kinds of preservation goals. So if we were to capture the build environment and the execution environments uh, using, using something like virtualization, uh, and then also capture the source code and executables, we would then be, in essence, preserving the computing capabilities. Uh, if we take a different approach, maybe a simpler approach, um, where we just keep, the, say, like the source code and, and some dependencies, um, we're not entirely preserving the full execution. We're just kind of, uh, uh, we can address the, the notion of archiving for making research open and transparent. So, so th this, this smaller piece is what we decided to, to do because that's what we're most uh, able to provide. So that's kind of what I wanna talk a little bit about. Um, this this uh, idea of just, you know, archiving code for publication um, because that's what our, our data archive currently is focused on. That's what research has come to us for. Uh, we haven't really had many people come to us asking for full preservation of their workflow. Um, so this is just a cartoon of what the process looks like. Um, and this will look very familiar if you work with data management because it's exactly the research data management workflow. Um, so a researcher will come to us with some data, some code, and some documentation. Uh, we will then take this information package it up in some way that makes sense for what they want to achieve and put it up on our, our, our Dataverse instance. Uh, this is our sharing platform. And we're also looking to do the same thing using the open science framework. So uh, the interesting parts uh, I think come in, in this uh, uh, packaging part. 
uh, and that's kind of what I want to focus a little bit on. So there's two there's two things that I want to talk about, which I think are very interesting because on the sur uh, surface they seem simple, but they can have a lot of uh, nuance. So the first one is the notion of granularity. So suppose a researcher gives us uh, some data and some code, right? And they say, okay, well, I want you to, you know, put this together in some way that's that's shareable. So you can imagine there's there's a, a wide range of a wide number of permutations to this, right? We can take this data and this code uh, and package it up so that the software and the data are, are separate, each with its own separate identifier, uh, or we can just package it all in one big uh, blob and have that be the object of uh, of sharing, or we can do do um, something that's just completely um, separate, each with its own identifier. Um, now this. The, the challenge here is that, you know, there's no hard rule that says how this should be done for a particular use case. Um, so what we all we can really do um, is just kind of follow a rule of thumb that says to describe and package things in a way that makes sense um, so that others can reproduce and reuse the work. And, and figuring this out is part of the consultative process working with the researcher. Um, so that was a kind of the conceptual view of this idea of granularity. Uh, if we move now to putting this in practice, there's a couple more challenges um, that we face. So uh, because we use Dataverse, uh, it has, because of its design, it has some limitations. So in, when it comes to packaging up code, uh, we're kind of constrained to using this one blob approach where the data and the code is, lives under one set of metadata and one identifier. <coughs> identifier. Um, as far as, uh, you know, making this work in Dataverse, what we've done is we've created a, a custom software metadata block that can, uh, contains special metadata just for the software. Uh, if we look at the same idea using the Open Science Framework, um, it's a little bit more flexible because uh, there's no constraints on how you can structure things. So if you wanted to, you could have very easily all sorts of different pieces, each with its own identifier and metadata. Uh, the challenge is that because it's unstructured, uh, it takes a lot more work to actually have something that is, uh, uh, you know, uh, machine readable, let's say like metadata, for example. So what we are, are experimenting with uh, is using a, uh, a software ontology platform uh, out of the earth science community called Ontosoft. Uh, it comes with a nice, uh, very nice user interface. It stores everything in structured length data formats which is very nice because we can export that and then save that into the OSF. Uh, the other concept that I wanted to talk about was versioning. So uh, there's, this issue also comes up with data, um, but uh, it's also very important for software. So uh, when it comes to software, there's uh, the relationship between versions and identifiers. There's three different potential relationships. So you can have an, an identifier that points to a specific version of the software. You can have an identifier that points to the, the concept of the software in general, or it can point to the latest version. And, and these are, by the way, from, from this paper, uh, the software citation principles, which you might have heard of. Um, so, so if we're trying to version things in this uh, data sharing, software sharing, uh, these software sharing platforms like Dataverse, uh, one and three, uh, we can kind of do okay. Uh, the second one is not so much. Uh, if we look at the same thing in the open science framework, we can, we can actually do all three if we wanted to simultaneously uh, using a combination of, of components and registrations. Um, again, the downside here is that it requires more effort on the part of the person doing this to actually structure it so that you can actually achieve these, uh, these different, or you can address these different ways of looking at versioning. Uh, so there's a lot of other challenges, obviously, that I didn't talk about. Um, so there's issues around curation, uh, appraising what's there, uh, extracting metadata from documentation, and so forth. All this is a manual process that we're doing right now. Um, there's a, the other issues. Uh, so we, we're not really testing to see if what we get from the researcher works and it does what it says, uh, what they say it does. Uh, so associated with this, you know, um, we have to think of do we require people to use certain tools like virtualization or things like ReproZip to help this? Um, you know, maybe, but we don't want to scare people away, right? Uh, if they see that they have to use this, they might 
go somewhere else or they might not even bother sharing their code. And uh, the most important aspect, I think, is uh, education. Um, so basically, we want to avoid the scenario where the researcher spends three days to make their paper reproducible at the very end of the process. Instead, we just we want to have this uh, these educational uh, resources uh, or outreaches or, or whatever, so that when they have to make their uh, paper shareable and open at the end, it only takes them one hour. Um, so to wrap up here, uh, I just want to say that you know yes, we can work to some degree uh, within existing data workflows to incorporate software, uh, but better preservation will require uh, different workflows. Um, and one last plug here for the Software Preservation Network is that one of the things that we're looking at is how, how do we help researchers avoid that 36-hour thing and turn it into one hour. That's it. Thank you.